I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And welcome back to Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. It's week four, October 2022 theme month. Our fourth and final selection comes from 1971. It's a genre I've wanted to work into the podcast for a while. It's one I'm a, a fond I'm fond of. There's not a lot of examples in this canon, and this is one of the most prominent. It is the blood on Satan's claw. Well, to be fair, we have done... Well, I guess it was pre-podcast. We Mm. have done this on movie night before. Yeah, we did uh, the original Wicker Man. Yeah. This is possibly the only horror film set during the reign of William and Mary, 1690s England. Before we get into the plot, get some first impressions from Rob. And there's probably an obvious question you want to ask me. Which is? What Why did I choose this? No, I assume you have a reason for, mm-hmm. for choosing this. We've done movie night long enough. I don't question your motives most of the time. Mm. There's There are a few exceptions. <laughs> but for the most part, I don't question your, your intentions or motives. First impressions, this is odd. I don't know if I love this genre mm-hmm. or not. Okay. Wicker Man was fine. It was okay. Again, this is not... Not so where my, thing. Well, where my brain is already going is where I'm going to put this in the rankings for this oh, yeah. month. That's that's where my brain is. Mm. It wasn't my favorite. It was it was it was okay. There was some fun stuff in it. You were pretty darn tired when you watched it. Yes, I am. But. So that uh, that might have had some effect. And to try to keep your attention, but there's fun stuff. I I, I I quipped more than I've ever like when I first saw this this movie about ten years ago, and the subsequent times I've seen it. I think I've seen it probably about three or four times now. I treated it dead serious. Oh, yeah. And I think that's a different experience than when you're kind of riffing on it a little bit. I first became aware of this movie. So I went to Scotland in 2012. And one night I was staying in a bed and breakfast in Inverness, the very tippity top of mainland Scotland. And I was in that night and I was watching TV and there was a series on the history of British horror. And I've been thinking about this. I don't think I saw this talked about that night. I think I saw a different episode. But when I got back to the United States, I watched the whole thing uh, online. And there was an episode of that, it was a three-part series, that talked for a better part of 10 minutes about folk horror movies. And this was the one that they spotlighted. And there was an interview with the director, Piers Highgard, who who talked about some things that I'll probably bring up later in the... uh, in the podcast, but it was just such an odd thing, and there's just so nothing like it. I had mentioned before, because uh, usually when I'm programming, I all but immediately know what I want to put in a given slot. And whereas you say you often have to kind of struggle through a bunch of films to choose what you want want to show, this year, and, and as is often the case with, with how... Uh, October, I have a bunch of stuff. I, ha- I have, you know, I could do multiple months of, of Which program. is why generally you do three out of the four. Yeah. So. Or, yeah. I had about a half a dozen that I was considering. And I didn't think I'd be able to find this one available to stream. And we found it on a ch- uh, something called Newcastle After Dark, which uh, is a Pennsylvania-based horror show. And you can stream it. And so once I found out you can stream it, I decided I wanted to show it. And the reason why, beyond wanting to get a folk horror movie in at some point, is I have, to my knowledge, never met or had an opportunity to talk to someone else who had seen it. And I wanted to talk to somebody about it with the context of them having seen it. Okay. What parts of this plot do you find to be the most effective? Well, we should talk a little bit first about about what the overall plot is. Do you want to give us... A summary? The IMDb plot synopsis is, In 17th century England, the children of a village slowly convert into a coven of devil worshippers. But it hinges... That's the IMDb plot synopsis. To expand a little bit about that, They there's a, a laborer in the field who discovers some unusual bones. And that's kind of our introduction to this. He goes and gets the owner of the land... Who doesn't believe him? And it's, it's not so much the owner of the land. So the the owner of the land is basically dead, and so he's got an heir who's his nephew, and then his widow lives there at the house, and she is entertaining the judge. Oh, you're right. Who has come in from the city? Yeah, you're to right. To visit and had once had a 
he, he says to the nephew later on, you know, I was once pretty sweet on your aunt. And, you know, we, we were, we almost, almost got together and then we didn't get together. Yeah. But anyways, he gets the judge and they're kind of investigating it, but the judge is not believing this at all. And then as they, as the movie uh, continues to progress, we actually start to see this coven thing. And these, the youth of this village are transforming into these creatures in time. In part. Yeah. So the unearthing of the bones in a very Lovecraftian way has released a, a dark evil into the world. And it starts to infect people. And the first person it infects is the fiancé of the uh, the nephew, the heir to the land, who is a peasant girl. Uh, her prospective aunt is not too pleased. I believe that's Angel Blake, played by Linda no, Hayden. No, that's not Angel Blake. That's uh, oh, okay. the Ustinov. Oh, Tamara uh, Ustinov, who is a uh, daughter of Sir Peter Ustinov. Okay. Rosalind Barton. Yeah, so so the aunt's not too pleased because she's pretty sure that that her nephew got this woman pregnant, and that's why she's going to be the heir to this house. Which they don't ever actually resolve whether yeah. that she is or. I, I think so. I kind of suspect so. I mean, that's that's what's it's implied. Well, with the way he's uh, sneaking around with her, yeah, yeah, and. She is there at night getting horribly beat in cards because she doesn't know what she's doing because she's not from the leisured classes. And she can't go home that night because of issues with her family, and so they decide to put her up in an attic room that That hasn't hasn't been been occupied in five years. And Satan gets her, and she goes mad, and she's escorted off. Well, first she attacks the aunt. Yeah, she yeah. attacks the aunt. And so they have to nail the door shut to trap her in the attic. And yeah. And the next day, the, the authorities come to take her away. And this evil continues to spread through the village, well, principally among the Well, but even the way the in which that they treat her and take her away, mm-hmm. you feel kind of bad for her. Yeah, you do feel bad for her. She was a real victim of circumstances. Yeah. But this percolates, uh, as I said, principally through the youth they gather around one particular charismatic young lady, uh, the aforementioned Angel Blake, played by Linda Hayden, only 17 years old at the time of filming. And she sets these children against each other to perform sacrifices. The devil infects the flesh uh, of various locals causing it to grow a uh, hairy furry substance which is then cut off to be assembled into an incarnation of the devil and that is more or less the plot the evil plot and then the counter narrative has to do with those that are resisting it let's talk a little bit about the judge played by peter weimark Patrick Weimark. Patrick Weimark. Now, we know from some of the trivia that was discussed by the host of Newcastle After Dark that there were uh, three people approached uh, or desired for this part. The first was Peter Cushing, who simply couldn't do it because of his wife's illness. Christopher Lee was also considered, I believe I read elsewhere, he was busy with another project, and apparently also... Well, I'm thinking about his accent. I don't think he would have been any better in this role. Yeah. And Donald Pleasance uh, yeah. was also considered. But they went with uh, Patrick Weimark because uh, they could get him. I agree with the host of uh, Newcastle that it's probably to the benefit of the film that somebody who isn't so well-known got the part and didn't come with a bunch of baggage about what to expect because you don't know what to expect from this character. Well, and, and I agree with that. I think that's accurate. Thinking about those three people... It's hard to imagine this movie with any of those in them. Hmm. And Donald it would take Pleasance you out. It would take you out. Yeah. Because they're so well known. Well, Christopher Lee and uh, Peter Cushing. Peter Cushing. I could envision those better, but like like a Donald Pleasance, I, I can't even I can't even imagine that. Hmm. What did you think of him? What did you think of the judge? I I didn't like him, but I don't know that you're intended to like hmm. him. But his performance, I thought, was was fine. So one thing that is really a part of this film, a part of a lot of British films, especially if they're historical set, and kind of unspoken but still there, is the class divides. Yeah. Kind of that caste system. This guy 
is supposed to be the judge over this community. He doesn't really care for him. He he doesn't like other than the other than other the than aunts, what he can get from the like the yeah. Aunt, yeah. And you know the people of his class, he's fine with them, but he looks down on the others. He, he's uh, he doesn't trust the the young man who says I dug up a weird bones. He's like oh, you're messing with me and wasting my time. He's not very heroic, and he disappears well, for even, most of the movie. Even when he's wielding the sword at the end of the movie. He's not really like a hero or anything like that. No. Like it's just yeah. Everybody yeah. The, he's got a bunch of trapped occultists, and they're surrounded, and he's he's going for it. Yeah. So he ultimately does the right thing. One thing I thought was interesting about about him is so we got the doctor. I like the uh, doctor character. This is when you usually like to kind of push in who the doctor character is. Yeah. Oh, Howard uh, Gorney plays the doctor. So he is, I love his first line early on. I forget, he's doing treating something. He says, there's much that we have yet to learn. I'm like, that's it, doctor. You realize that you're in a kind of an ignorant time and you're just doing the best you can. And then he starts to get a little bit more superstitious-y and he loans this book on witchcraft to the judge who's like, I'm going to go into town and study this thing and I'll be back. And then the judge says, now you must be patient Many will die. (laughs) The evil must grow. You know, an hour or two ago, you're like, there's no witchcraft. And now you've got this whole idea of the witchcraft act is to grow before you can cut it down. Well, of the non-youth characters in the movie, my favorite was actually Reverend Fallowfield. Yes. I kind of enjoyed his... Again, I don't think you're intended necessarily to like him, but I enjoyed his performance. And I like that his name is a is a is a joke. Is a joke, yes. And he's obsessed with animals. He is teaching a kind of catechism class to the youths. He's not very well respected by them. He is accused by Angel Blake early on of being a sexual predator in an effort to get him out of the way because he's started to realize, you know, one of the first adults to realize that there's evils uh, evil going on. He, like the judge, who again disappears from most of the movie, and it isn't until the heir, the, the nephew, shows up to say, things have gone batty. Into, it's, it's chaos. You need to go, so I guess I'll come back. I'm ready now. I'll bring in reinforcements. But the reverend also disappears. After the reverend is exonerated, you see him being let out, and he doesn't show up in the rest of the movie. That feels like a mistake. He comes back at the end, doesn't he? No. I thought that I was don't him at the very end. No, unless, he, unless he's silent in a crowd scene, huh. he, he's, he's gone. He's not his... And it just feels like there was more story there that got cut for some reason, or they yeah. couldn't get the actor. But yeah. that's a noticeable issue uh, with the film. One other performer that I particularly liked in this is the playing the character of Kathy Vesper's is Wendy Padbury, who is just adorable. Yeah. She meets a bad end. She is most known for being one of the Doctor's companions in Doctor Who. Again, for the record, I have never seen an episode of Doctor Who. How is it that I've seen more Doctor Who than Mm -hmm. you? But she is sweet on the the head farmhand, the the guy that that finds the, the bones early on. And she gets uh, killed in a uh, satanic rite in the old church. And the lady that is reading, Margaret, who's reading the satanic incantations as they kill her, is later pursued as a witch and forced, thrown into water. If she sinks, she's not a witch. If she floats, she's a witch. It's like, well, I think you guys just killed her because she's not floating up. And they're just kind of like, oh, okay, we're going to leave. And so the farmhand rescues her, takes her back. And she is nursed back to health by him, the uh, futive fiancé of uh, the ill-fated Kathy, and Kathy's mother, not realizing that connection. And for a while, it looks as though Kathy's fiancé and the woman that killed her are going to be a thing. That doesn't work out, but there's a, a deep you know, irony to that. Where did she get that book? She's reading very precise ceremonial incantations from a book. Where'd that come from? 
I hadn't thought about that, but yeah. Eventually, the doctor, after being basically guilted into doing it, cuts the uh, satanic uh, hair growth off of Kathy's thigh. Not Kathy's thigh. Uh, Margaret's thigh. And then Margaret gets away to go back to Angel and say, I wanted to give my flesh to Satan, but they cut it off. I'm sorry. And uh, Angel uh, leads her into a bear trap and gets her foot stuck in that. And then... But while the... uh that's to use her as bait, basically, because they're being pursued by dogs. By dogs, because the judge has brought Hodor and a bunch of dogs into town. I didn't really see a lot of troops. At the, my memory was that there was troops, but it's basically just villagers that yeah. they, they round up. And these villagers are really, many of them are really ready to go on the witch hunt. And they were talking about early on, uh, the judge was like, well, we don't do that, that anymore. It's like, we, that needs to be in the past. It's like, that was the uncivilized... 1500s. We're in the sophisticated 1600s. And yet they end up chasing them around with pitchforks. Yeah, and torches. Yeah. And they commit a, a massacre. They round them all up in the church. And they, they, they corral them. They, they corral yeah. them. They kill Angel. They kill the incarnating fiend, which is the most disappointing part of this movie because they just didn't have a budget to do that right. And the film ends, and again, by implication... There's going to be a score, 30 or so people in that. They're going to just kill them all because that's what the judge was talking about doing. So you just have to cut it out. You, yeah. can't, you can't save these people. We should talk a little bit about the rape scene. This is the rare episode where I thought about maybe putting a content warning. <laughs> this movie is not for all audiences. That, that scene is intense, especially for freaking 1971. Yeah. Thoughts? It's part of why I'm not sure if I love the genre. It seems like that is more... Granted, I have not seen a lot of folk horror, but it seems like it's more common in that genre. Though there's definitely exploitation that happens in a lot of horror Mm -hmm. genres, but you just don't normally see it quite depicted in that way. Mm. So in the History of Horror documentary... The host interviews uh, director Peter Seigard about it, and he says, looking back at that scene now, I think I went too far. Because at the time, it didn't bother me. I knew it was going to be a very kinetic, powerful scene, a type of scene you don't get very much, and I was so taken with it that I just kind of went overboard and just let it go just all over the place because we were going to show something you didn't really see on screens at that time. It's like decades later, looking back on it, I'm like, that was a little intense. Well, in the jumping ahead a little bit in the trivia that I was reading, the director claims that it was an unplanned scene and that it was created during the shooting. Okay. He even, he said that even the coven's chant was written on the spot. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, you'll probably... The chant is the part of it that I actually thought was the most effective. Mm. But it's it's disturbing. <laughs> yeah. And and you talked about the written on the spot. So this was a film, and they talked a bit about, about it on the Newcastle, that was intended to be a trilogy. And it was intended originally to be set in Victorian times. But the people at Tigard Film said, Victorian's been done to death. Yeah. Let's go back further. And I thought that was really effective. Because we're seeing... A really a different world, a world seldom if ever seen on screen, especially in a horror context. And it kind of makes that all more real because the perspective of these relatively primitive people, I mean, they're they're pretty on board for the for the most part of yeah, there's witches and there's all sorts of occultic stuff, and that's yeah. very real. Uh, before we get to the trivia, I did want to talk about one of my pet theories about this film. Okay. Given the time in which this was made in the early 70s, and given what the story is about, I think there is a definite subtext about then-contemporary issues. What do you think that is? Do you have any ideas? What is thematically this about? I I don't. I'm not familiar enough with all of that to connect the dots that you're laying out. So you've got two big camps in, in, the, in this film. You've got very establishment, wealthy group of uh, personified by older people like the judge. Yeah. 
You've got a bunch of young people that have gone off the reservation and they're wearing flowers in their hair and they have incense and they're doing all sorts of spooky stuff out in the woods. They're freaking hippies. It's an establishment versus hippies narrative pushed back 280 years. I can see that now that you point it out. Watching it, I just viewed it as old versus young, mm-hmm. which also fits the dynamic you're laying mm-hmm. out. But that, yeah, that's just how I interpreted it. And the establishment time. wins. It it defeats the hippies. There are some young people that are okay, but they're the kind of young people that went home on Saturday night and watched Lawrence Welk with their folks. <laughs> Those ones are okay, but the hippies they need to be Kent stated, which is what they wow. do in that church. Wow. Too soon. <laughs> too, too far. <laughs> All yeah. right, trivia time. Oh, I, I'm not trying to jump ahead. I just was trying to... No, yeah. that's, that's basically my spiel. Okay. For the film's U.S. release, the film's nudity was censored, particularly in, in Linda Hayden's seduction scene, by darkening the, the footage to avoid an X rating. And I assume that must be because of her age. Yeah. Oh, did, did you know Patrick Weimark died shortly after making I the did. film? I Bef- did. Uh, between the wrapping production and theatrical release, he died like two months after mm-hmm. the shooting wrapped. According to the co-star Simon Williams for the scene where Patrick Weimark slaps him out of hysteria, uh, Weimark really did strike him painfully. I could believe that. Oh. Very method. On her first day of, shoot- of filming, star Linda Hayden cut her foot badly and had to be rushed to a local hospital for stitches. She stated in an, inter- in an interview that due to it being in costume and makeup for her devilish scene, some older folks at the hospital thought that she was either an angel or devil and that they had passed over. Well, she was both. She was yeah. an angel possessed of a devil. Apparently, opening credits of some versions of the film titled it The Blood on Satan's Claw, whereas others dropped the word the and titled it simply Blood on Satan's Claw. And the U.S. release apparently was done as a double feature with the film The Beast in the Cellar. The serpent caught from the field by the reverend is actually a slow worm, a legless lizard found throughout England. Hmm. Audible released a spoken word adaptation of the film in 2018 with actress Linda Hayden, who played Angel in the film, but in the, the spoken word adaptation, she played a different role. And I did find online that there's apparently a uh, illustrated novelization, hmm. which I assume was probably created decades later, because this film did uh, get a cult following, even though I don't imagine it was very successful at the time it released. Well, I saw something that said it was not a, a, a successful film. I haven't looked at any numbers yet, but... So this uh, delves into a, a entertaining and iconic line from the movie. Do you have a favorite line from the judge? Oh. No. I no. think you'll remember as soon as I say it. Okay. But when the judge proposes an ironic toast to his Catholic majesty, King Charles oh, III, he is referring to the young pretender, Charles Edward Stuart. Bonnie Prince Charlie. Yeah. Who would have been King Charles III of England had his claim to the throne succeeded. This places the action firmly in the 18th century. Although he spent most of his life in exile, the comment, God bless him and keep him in exile, probably refers to his final exile after the failure of of the 1745 rebellion. The judge's initial skepticism of the superstitious villagers' fears is probably historically valid. Belief in witchcraft among the educated classes had waned by this time. The laws against practicing witchcraft were repealed in 1736 and replaced by a prohibition on pretending to practice such. The last documented trial and execution for witchcraft in England took place in 1716. And the way the line comes across is he says, I give you his Catholic majesty, King James III. May God bless him and keep him in exile. And I laughed pretty hard at that line. Mm. And there is some disagreement, I guess, about the setting, because I had heard in other material that this was supposed to be during the reign of William and Mary, which would have put it in the 1690s, but some of this other material indicates it's close to the 1730s or 40s. All I'm seeing on this budget in terms of box office is an estimated budget of 82,000 euros. Well, of uh, Great British GP, GBP, GBPs, so Great, Brit, Great Britain, British pounds at the time. Yeah. 
the movie has a 73% on Rotten Tomatoes with an IMDb score of 6.4. Yeah. Which How would you rate it? Rating. I really I like it. Do you think this holds up better with repeat viewings? Or I don't know if it does hold up better with repeat viewings. I think the shock of it, uh, especially the first time I saw it, I did find it quite shocking because I watched it alone and I was quiet and it just, uh, I hadn't really seen anything quite like, like this. It's, it's so different and especially at the time, you know, it, it was really about touching nerves and, and doing things that hadn't been done before. Again, it gets so intense and excessive at times that that can be off-putting. So it's not a film I love. It's a film that I hesitate to even recommend to people because it's so peculiar and so... There's a few more intense scenes. Yeah. But in general, I think the intensity helps it with yeah. the exception of like the rape scene. Yeah. So I would give this, I would give this three stars on the four-star scale, and I think I would give it a seven or eight on the ten. We're close. I think I'm like two and a half and six. Though I'm kind of doubting myself and wanting to go with like a seven because this is impactful. Mm -hmm. It is entertaining. Like I'm not, there's not, I mean, we've critiqued it a little bit, but it's it's not a bad film in any way, shape, or it's, form. It's, and it's not long. It's about an hour and 35 minutes. And I think, you know, if, if you're up to it, you're going to get something you haven't seen before. Absolutely. If, if you give it a try. Yeah. Which brings us to the other challenge of the month, which is the rankings. Yeah. So, reviewing in order, we watched Halloween 4, Dominion prequel to The Exorcist, Bram Stoker's Dracula, and The Blood on Satan Claw, Satan's Claw. Do you want to give that, give us your ratings? Hmm. You know, you could really go either way between Dominion and Bram Stoker's Dracula. And then I would go The Blood on Satan's Claw and Halloween 4 last. I, I think we're in pretty much the same boat. Halloween 4 was awful. So that is fourth place. The Blood on Satan's Claw, really inventive, but uh, not top flight. Dominion prequel to The Exorcist and Bram Stoker's Dracula are very close in my book. And I was thinking about this earlier today, and I will give you an actual ranking, and I will explain why I'm ranking it this way. I am going to give the number two slot to Dominion prequel to The Exorcist and the number one slot to Bram Stoker's Dracula. And the reason I'm going to do that is because Dominion prequel to The Exorcist is Paul Schrader doing his thing, doing his faith crisis thing. I like it, but I've seen it before. Francis Ford Coppola's Bram Stoker's Dracula is a fresher take on Dracula than Paul Schreider's take was on The Exorcist. So it, it ekes. It ekes out a victory for the month. You convinced me right there on, mm. on that alone. Yeah. I'm with you. All right. I've got a weird grin on my face because I think this year is the most times that I have picked the top rated movie of the month. Yeah. Oh. Um, I'm on I'm on a little bit of a streak here, mm -hmm. <laughs> which also this and you guys will hear this episode before the episode I'm going to reference, including a pick I made earlier this year, which Nate says might possibly be the best movie we've ever covered on the podcast. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm on a little bit of a streak right yeah, here, yeah. which is uh, different from my streak last year. <laughs> So if we factor the two together, you're kind of doing middling. <laughs> so, well, if there's nothing else, I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And this is Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. You got your Klingons running through a cornfield. Klingons crashed in Oklahoma. Which one is this? This is Star Trek Enterprise. Okay. Which uh, is about the birth of the Federation. I can't remember what those guys are called. They're bad. You're going to switch screens? Yeah. We recording? Not recording? Yeah. All right. We done be ready. I had something else I was going to say, but I've lost my train of thought. Yeah, folk horror, that's that's a, a very different genre. I I can see the appeal to it. 
Not, I, I'd want to see more of it before I say whether I love it or not. Yeah, and it's a very limited canon. So, well, we, but this is also so different from the Wicker Man. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, so in the uh, BBC horror documentary, uh, they they talk about the unholy trinity of folk horror, which is this film, The Blood on Satan's Claw, The Wicker Man, and a film that was also referenced, I believe, the Newcastle wraparound material, The Witchfinder General. Now, okay. uh, I've seen all three. Uh, I, I, I would rank them The Wicker Man, The Blood on Satan's Claw, and then The Witchfinder General. Okay. And the documentary talks about how, actually it's not the documentary, it's the blog I was reading just talking about those three. It says that this is the most, the purest folk horror because The uh, Witchfinder General, there's a revenge story. The Wicker Man starts out as a police de- detective story. This is just pure folk horror. It, I mean, it really doesn't fall into any other categories. Yeah. There's other films. I, I tend to think that The Devil Rides Out, which we watched a few years ago, I would loop that loosely into folk horror. There's a film called The Wicker Tree that's also uh, folk horror. It's from the same guy who did uh, The Wicker Man, basically doing a different version of it decades, decades later. And there's just a tiny, tiny scattering of things that kind of Venn diagram a bit in, into this genre. But there's just something very primal about it. it it's a different type of horror because it, it, you know, it doesn't fall into some of these easy categories. It's about this kind of unknown, creepy something out in the woods or under the ground or this weird reemergence of a paganism like in The Wicker Man. Well, but the also casting it as like an infection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's there's a lot of uh, pitchforks and fires and incantation and, and earth and woods and, and grain and flowers. You know, so oddly in this one, I thought that the torches were more effective than the pitchforks. Mm-hmm. Like the pitchforks almost seem to kind of stand out, but mm-hmm. I don't know why, because it w- would have been relatively historically accurate. So, no. but the torches I thought fit well. Yeah, it's it's a it's a, it's a torches and pitchfork horror movie. That's like no torches and pitchfork horror movie you've ever seen. Fun stuff. Tangent. Okay. Dracula movies. Okay. That we've covered on the podcast. How do you rank Nosferatu, Nosferatu the Vampire, and Bram Stoker's Dracula? Oh, that'd be a tough one. I'd, I'd have to I'd have to think about it. No, yeah. my knee jerk reaction I hadn't put any thought into it before the question popped I'd into my brain. I'd probably have to put Nosferatu first, the original Nosferatu. I actually think I like Nosferatu the Vampire the most. Mm. I I was blown away by that movie when we watched it. I had not seen something like that before. Yeah, I, I'm I'm unsure. Yeah. It's kind of almost. Uh, Seems unfair to try and rank them. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. And, of course, we've got Bela Lugosi and Christopher Lee and and apparently Dario Argento, who's been a recent topic of discussion between us, did a, a purportedly awful version in about 2013. So it is the property that, uh, that keeps coming back. It's freaking undead. Did you hear they're making a another Christmas story? With Peter Billingsley and the mom. Yeah. Have you heard about that? I have. It's this. I would love it if it's good. It seems like if, it's just if, too easy to get wrong. Well, it's 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 this. It's the way the market is now. It's like if there is something that has something of a cult following. If there's a market to make something else, they'll do it. Yeah. Years and decades and decades later, if they can get maybe any of the originals involved, that's the preference. Yeah. But things that wouldn't be green light without streaming are being green lit left and right, and I don't know oh, yeah. how, how well that's working. 